I think we'll go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, I'm Cynthia Edwards, the Science Coordinator with the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC. Uh, today's webinar is being done jointly with Blair Turpak, who is a geographer with the USGS at the National Wetlands Center in uh, National Wetlands Research Center, sorry, in Lafayette. Uh, for those of you who have been engaged in our landscape conservation design efforts to date, uh, Blair handles a lot of the GIS work that goes into those and will continue to do so. So our topic today is on landscape conservation design 101 and we're going to include an example that Blair has been working on. Uh, this, uh, the idea to do this webinar came out of some recent presentations that we've done at the Oklahoma chapter of the Wildlife Society meeting in Tulsa in early February and then more recently at the Texas chapter of the Wildlife Society that was held in Corpus Christi just a couple weeks ago. Might as well go to the next slide, Blair, thanks. Just a couple of acknowledgements. I wanted to uh, acknowledge a couple of my colleagues. Uh, John Turpak with the Gulf Restoration Program for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Some of the slides I'm going to be showing today are from his original work when he was science coordinator for the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC. And then some of the more recent additions to the presentation were um, through a meeting that we had just last week with Todd jones Ferrand, who is the new science coordinator of the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC. Uh, that was a meeting that Blair and I were at last week and I'll reference it a bit later. Uh, next slide. So landscape conservation design, really what I want to cover today is a, a short overview of what it is and how it can be used and why we would want to use it. So conservation design is really a partnership driven method to assess current and future conditions and offer a spatially explicit depiction of those desired future conditions. So really taking a good look at where we're at now and where we need to be uh, in order to meet our species and population objectives and then to provide management options for meeting those conditions. So for those of you who are familiar with the strategic habitat conservation framework, landscape conservation design really takes the biological planning and conservation design elements of that and puts them together in one um, collaborative approach. Next slide, Blair, thanks. So, as I mentioned, it's a collaborative conservation, a planning process that brings all of the partners together who you want to work with. And we use that collaborative process to identify conservation goals and associated targets for those goals, describing the desired landscape condition to support those objectives. So again, getting to the what the landscape looks like now and what we need it to look like to address the needs of our, in our case, within the GCP, our focal species. And then that is combined with um, the spatially explicit products, so the GIS products that help identify those priority areas and then are also used to estimate the amount of action necessary to attain those objectives. So not only where it is, but what it is and how much of it is needed to meet those species objectives. And there are lots of conservation design elements out there. There's lots of maps, lots of partnerships have done some semblance of this in the past. And I'll get to, at the end, we'll get a little bit more specifically in what we see our role as the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC partnership and staff in, in doing that. So conservation design identifies um, areas of land and those site characteristics and the landscape con context and configuration. So really getting to the point that all acres are not um, created equally. Uh, for different species, they need different things. They need either connectivity might be uh, an issue, large patch size might be something that another species needs. And what landscape conservation design helps you do is put those elements together so you can identify the areas where you can get the most the most bang for your bucks, so to speak, in terms of conservation objectives. So the next, uh, this really just outlines um, the specificity that's required. So 
This really gets to conservation decisions reflecting a specific action at a specific place to affect an, a specific target. This isn't this is really moving away from uh, conservation at a broad brush stroke. So looking at things like restoring 200 acres of coastal habitat, coastal prairie in Cameron Parish to provide nesting habitat for model duck, or using a prescribed burn management practice on 40 acres of cross timbers in Love County in Oklahoma um, for bob white. And then also this enables us to bring in the aquatic systems and make sure those are linked with the terrestrial systems so looking at things like stream bank stabilization on the Colorado River um, to reduce erosion and maintain temperatures that Guadalupe bass need for their life cycle. And then the map products come in a bit later. So we've got a few examples here, um, the Mississippi Alluvial Valley and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service watershed priorities in the southeast region. And then we've also got um, the whooping crane example uh, from a product. Uh, this is a product from a project that we, uh, the GCP funded, uh, looking at uh, avian habitats in the mid coast of Texas. So really using the information that's available at the time to identify high use, low use, and incidental use in this case for whooping cranes. So beginning to look at where we can focus those efforts. So the appeal of conservation design, this really gets to the why. Why do we want to do this more effectively? So uh, the first is efficiency, optimization, and accountability. As conservation organizations, uh, state, federal agencies, NGOs, we all have to do more with less. So this really enables us to help identify those best spots for conservation efforts. A picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, we get asked a lot, Blair and I do, for uh, maps and map products, and uh, we use the Conservation Planning Atlas to serve out some of those products within this LCC. Um, but really, a picture makes it really clear to others uh, outside the group that developed the landscape conservation design what your shared vision and shared goals really are. The next is working at scale. Uh, this is where people can see themselves in the design, regardless of whether or not they're working at the local scale, so a delivery scale, all the way up to state, regional, and national scales. And it's really important when you're doing landscape conservation design that people can see themselves in that and that you can incorporate those broad scale factors into those site scale decisions and, and the other way as well. And it also enables us to use a science-based approach that's transparent, defensible, and replicable. And we're really working closely with uh, adjacent LCCs, uh, the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks, as I mentioned, um, so that we can look even broader than an individual LCC at what we want to do in terms of landscape design. And then there's some opportunities, increasing the effectiveness of expenditures, of course, and being able to really monitor what those actions on the ground resulted in. Identifying places to pool resources, so where can you meet a, a number of species or habitat objectives in one single place or a series of places. Raising new money, for those of us who have worked on the nonprofit side, it's really important when you go in to a potential funder that you have a clear objective and you've stated your goals clearly and you know what it's going to take to get there. Uh, dividing or guiding infrastructure development, this is increasingly important in areas uh, where we have a lot of energy development, which are the three states that the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC covers. Um, so this gets to things like uh, planning transmission lines or pipelines. And if you have a good conservation design, you can identify where that might have uh, reduced impact on certain species. The next is bringing a landscape perspective to local adaptation. So again, this is the what does this mean for me at various levels and, and how can uh, individual actions or smaller scale actions 
contribute to that landscape perspective. And then, of course, also relevant to our LCC is locating places to work and actions to take after disasters. So things like hurricanes, oil spills, tornadoes, whatever it might be that, that we deal with. Conservation design also helps you enable that. Where would you go next? And then the next, uh, this slide really demonstrates some of the scale that we're looking at. And this is going to be a topic of discussion on our science team webinar next week so that we can really get into the a good discussion on scale. So this depicts a sort of a regional, we would take a regional approach. Uh, temporally, a lot of the partners that we talk to uh, mention, you know, they're making management decisions a decade out. Um, some need to be made on a yearly basis, but decades seems to be what comes up the most. Ecologically, uh, we have a series of habitats we're looking at and, and also the species, the focal species in our case that are associated with that. Jurisdictionally, we're primarily looking at uh, state and national jurisdictions. And then uh, managerially, uh, conservation opportunity areas seems to be a term that folks are using. There's some baggage, I would say, with that. But uh, this really just depicts the, the scale dynamics that we need to go through in order to best identify at which levels we want to work. And now Blair, is, uh, I'll turn it back to her, and she's going to give an overview of the Edwards Plateau and some of the data that we've put together so far that can help us do conservation design in that area. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, so yeah, this is just going to be an example of how we could potentially do Edwards, uh, I'm sorry, a con uh, landscape conservation design in the Edwards Plateau. Um, this is more of a way to help get us to think about the ways we can do this than an actual definitive path. So this area here in green is the Edwards Plateau. Um, this is the boundary that was used by the Edwards Plateau Working Group. Um, so it's basically the maximum of all the ecological boundaries for the Edwards. Uh, so this area here in blue is the, um, the ecological site potential for mixed deciduous and juniper forest within the Edwards. Um, so that is a habitat, one of our broadly defined habitats for the GCP. It's associated with our focal species and it was defined by our um, science team. Um, and this is site potential, so it's not where it is right now, but where it has the potential to be based on things like soils and geography, um, et cetera. Uh, so we took this file and we subtracted out um, urbanization layers, um, so everything that's been um, developed and com basically converted to asphalt at this point, um, and removed that from the layer to create kind of potentially uh, a potentially restorable uh, mixed deciduous juniper forest layer. Uh, we then calculated the percentage of cover for each of those within all of the catchments um, that cover the Edwards Plateau. Um, the areas there in red have a higher percentage of, <clears throat> of that habitat. The areas in green have a lower percentage. Uh, we also took cultivated crops. That's those areas there in purple. Um, and we estimated their values by uh, their percentages um, by each of the catchments. And again, a catchment is a, is a small watershed. They're typically a couple of hundred acres, just to give you an idea of the scale here. Uh, these areas here in red have more cultivated crop, areas in green have less. Um, this is a little bit hard to see at this scale, but what this is is the natural patches within the Edwards Plateau. Um, that's the areas you see there in blue. Um, so we t basically took the Edwards Plateau and removed all of the fragmenters from it. So it took out all kind of developed areas like roads, urban areas, et cetera. Um, took out energy development um, land, so uh, power lines and um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, well pads, and also things like agriculture and um, um, and large water bodies, and then calculated the effective mesh size. So what an effective mesh size is is a relative um, fragmentation index by a planning unit. So we used um, catchments here, and so the higher the effective mesh size value, the less fragmented it is. 
So what those numbers are is essentially a reflection of the patch size within each of those catchments. So those areas there in red have a higher effective mesh and are less fragmented. Okay, so it took each of these three data sets and gave ranking scores to each of them. For here, um, the higher values mean a uh, higher priority. So within, for the restorable area, we gave um, the highest priority to those areas that have a higher percentage of um, potentially restorable mixed deciduous forest. Uh, we also, uh, with the cultivated crops, we did the reverse. So the areas that have less cultivated crops has a higher value. Uh, we did this because it would be potentially harder to restore areas that are currently in crops than those are just potentially need a different management practice. Um, and lastly, with the effective mesh size, we gave a higher ranking value to the areas that have a higher mesh size or a lower fragmentation rate. And this gives us a better, a better idea of the um, intactness of the landscape. And then we just sum those values together. Again, higher the value, the higher the priority. And this identifies then the high priorities based on those, um, on those criteria. Um, again, I want to just emphasize this is an example. Uh, we really need the experts in these geographies and these fields to be telling us things like, um, are these the right data sets that we should be using? Is this the right scale we should be looking at it? Should we be looking at the BCR? Should we be looking at it at the at something the size of the LCC or something smaller? Um, who are the people that should be at the table? And so these are things we're going to talk about with our science team um, both next week on our conference call and when we meet in person um, in uh, next month. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Cynthia. Great, thanks. Um, so Blair t touched on it, some of the roles uh, of the LCC and really I think what our key role is, is putting the people in the room who, who can do this and building that shared vision for the future. So for those of you who are, have been engaged in the LCC to date or have read some of our material, we have a list of focal species that we worked on that led to the development or formed the basis of the science strategy that was approved last year, and this is really the next step. So now that we have uh, species and uh, species objectives in some cases, and we understand the linkage between those species and the habitat needs. How do we begin to put this together? In some cases, we don't we don't have all the information we need yet to do conservation design for some of the species we want to include, and that's why we have some of the projects out on um, out for requests for proposals that we have uh, at the moment. And then we really want to enable partners to, to reach that vision. So again, stressing that collaborative process. So getting information from them on where they're investing now, what are their current priority areas? What's the, the return on investment for those areas? Um, so assessing that network condition. Where else, identifying where else we could invest if we did have the resources to do so, and what are the risks of doing so. So that brings in things like the future condition. So in Blair's example, she removed the urban areas. Well, we have, we can incorporate um, future projections for urban growth. How do we use those sorts of uh, uh, data and information to inform this process as well? And then how do we address those risks? So again, using the urban, um, example, uh, do we want to change, work to change the path of that urban expansion or increase the expansion of urban areas into area X instead of area Y? So those kinds of things. And this is what we will be uh, focusing on in the next uh, couple months with the science team. Uh, so just some next steps, primarily for the science team. And if folks have questions about that, um, feel free to ask. But uh, we want to clarify our shared vision. So what is it we want to achieve for those species we've identified as um, top tier focal species and the other species that we've identified within that list? We want to identify what those partner priority areas are now and how they can, are contributing to that. And then assess the current condition of the geography. And this gets back to the scale issue as well. So what scale works best for us within this partnership? 
We'll then need to identify the threats we can address, things like sea level rise, for example, uh, urban expansion, energy development, and identify strategies we might use to address those, and then assess the viability of them. And, and of course, this is a continuous loop, and there's always a discussion and options for proceeding. And really what we want to do is uh, on our science team call next week is really get prepared so that when we get together in uh, Oklahoma in April, we can focus on, on the rule set, so to speak, that we would use to identify the conservation design elements. So just a couple uh, next actions. Uh, as I'm, we mentioned, we've got a science team webinar on March 11th. Uh, that will enable us to prepare for the April meeting. We are meeting April 21st and 22nd to sketch out our recommended approach to landscape conservation design. We'll at that time be utilizing existing information, identifying those partner actions, identifying any additional gaps. As I mentioned, we've got a few projects out uh, right now that we're requesting full proposals for, and some of those do help fill the gaps. but. As those of you who work in uh, science and research know we're, we're a couple years away from, from getting results from those, and that's all right as long as we know it's, it's coming. And then we want to, of course, uh, the way our LCC works is we prepare uh, recommendations from the science team for the steering committee to review, and their next meeting is in June, although we do want to make some progress on this before between our April meeting and the the June Steering Committee meeting, so we'll be sketching that out a little bit more as well. And then if you have any uh, questions or you want more information or you want access to existing tools that we have in place like the Conservation Planning Atlas, uh, please don't hesitate to call or email either Blair or I. And most of the project, uh, inf all of the project information we've received to date is on the website, so I'd encourage you to look at that as well. And uh, more information is, is going up all the time. We have a couple projects that are in the final stages of review, and uh, that information should be up on the website shortly. So with that, I will um, open it up if there's any questions at this time. And as I mentioned, you can um, use the raise your hand feature or uh, just cut in on the phone 